All right, guys, we are in chapter 15. We're going to be looking at the Maritime Revolution to 1550. So we're going to get into um, beginning of like global trade exploration, things like that. Our instructional objectives for this chapter is compare the routes, moda, motives, and sailing technologies of those people who undertook global maritime expansion before 1550 to the routes, motives, and sailing technologies of the Portuguese and Spanish explorers of 1400 to 1550. Explain the environmental, technological, economic, and political factors that inspired Portugal and Spain to undertake voyages of exploration. Understand and explain the reasons for various different reactions of African and Asian peoples to the Portuguese trading empire, and then also describe and account for the Spanish ability to conquer territorial empire, a territorial empire in the Americas. <clears throat> All right, so let's uh, first get into the global maritime expansion before uh, 1450. So let's look at the Indian Ocean first. Um, Malayo Indonesian uh, Indonesians colonized the island of Madagascar in a series of voyages that continued through the 15th century. Arab uh, seafarers used the regular pattern of the monsoon winds to establish trade routes in the Indian Ocean. These trade routes flourished when the rise of Islam created new markets and new networks for Muslim traders. The Chinese Ming Dynasty sponsored a series of voyages to the Indian Ocean between 1405 and 1433. The Ming voyages were carried out on a grand scale involving fleets of over 60 large treasure ships and hundreds of smaller support vessels. The treasure ships carried out luxury goods, including silk and precious metals, as well as stimulating diplomatic relations with various African and Asian states. The voyages were not profitable, inspired opposition in court, and were ended in 1433. Now let's move to the Pacific Ocean. Over the period of several thousand years, peoples originally from Asia crossed the water to settle in the island of the East Indies, New Guinea, and the Melanesian and Polynesian islands. Uh, they also, areas included uh, the Marquis, New Zealand, and other sp Pacific islands out to Hawaii. Polynesian use of sweet potato domesticated in South America suggests that they have reached the Americas. Polynesian migration and establishment of colonies were aided by the development of large double-hold canoes that were used both paddlers and sails. Polynesian mariners navigated by the stars and by their observations of Indian of ocean currents and evidence and evidence of land. And so now let's move to the Atlantic Ocean. During the relatively warm centuries of the early Middle Ages, the Vikings navigating by stars in the seas explored and settled Iceland, Greenland, and Newfoundland, or Vinland. When a colder climate returned around 1200, the northern settlements of, in Greenland and the settlement in Newfoundland were found abandoned. A southern, a few southern Europeans, uh, a few southern Europeans and Africans attempted to explore the Atlantic in the 13th century and 14th centuries. Voyagers, uh, uh, voyagers from Genoa in 1291 and from Mali in the 1300s set out, set out into the Atlantic, but did not return. Gen uh, Genoese and Portuguese explorers discovered and settled the Madeiras, the Azores, and the Canaries in the fourth, 14th century. In the Americas, the Arawak from South America had colonized the lesser and greater Ant uh, Antilles by the year of 1000. The Carib followed, first taking the Arawak settlements in the Lesser Antilles, and then in the 15th century, raiding the Greater Antilles. So that gives you an idea of what was happening before what we think of as the Maritime Revol Revolution. People have this natural in instinct to want to explore, and that's shown there. That is a picture of the Chinese Yunk. If you look, it is compared to one of the European ships, so it was a much, much larger ship. Shows you the expansion is insanely interesting because we don't typically hear about this time period. And then gets into Middle and South America. 
All right, so let's talk about motives for exploration, okay? European expansion, things like that. So we're going 1400 to 1550. The Iberian Kingdom sponsored voyages of exploration for a number of reasons, including both the adventurous personalities of their leaders and long-term trends in European historical development. The, rival, the revival of trade, the struggle with Islam for control of, of the Mediterranean, curiosity about the outside world, and the alliances between rulers and merchants all played a part in this. The city-states of northern Italy had no incentive to explore Atlantic trade routes because they had established a system of alliances and trade with the Muslims that gave them a monopoly on access to Asian goods. Also, Italian ships were designed for the calm waters of the Mediterranean and could not stand up to violent weather in the Atlantic. The Iberian kingdoms had centuries of warfare with Muslims. They had no significant share of the Mediterranean trade, but they had advanced shipbuilding and cannon technology. They were open to new geographical knowledge and had exceptional leaders that really wanted to push these things forward. So let's talk about the Portuguese voyages. The Portuguese gained more knowledge of the sources of gold and slaves south of the Sahara when the forces when their forces led by Prince Henry captured the North Caravan city of Cuda or Suda C E U T A Prince Henry known as Prince Henry the Navigator then sponsored a research and navigation institute at Sergres to collect information about and send expeditions to the African lands south of North Africa the staff of Prince Henry's Research Institute in Ceres studied and improved navigational instruments, including the compass, the compass and the astrolabe. The astrolabe is basically a, a astronomical and, and geometrical uh, instrument that tells you your location on latitude based upon the stars and the angle in which you are front, uh, at that star. They also designed a new va a vessel called the Caravel, whose small size, shallow draft, combination of square and latin sails, and the cannon made it well suited for the task of exploration. Portuguese explorers eventually learned to pick up the prevailing westerly winds that would blow them back to Portugal, contributing important knowledge about oceanic wind patterns in maritime community. The Portuguese voyages eventually produced a financial return first from trade in slaves and then from the gold trade. Beginning in 1469, the process of exploration picked up speed as private commercial enterprises began to get involved. The Lisbon merchant, Ferneo Gomez, sent expeditions that discovered the develop and developed the island of Seo Tome and explored the Gold Coast. Bartolomeu Diaz and Vasco da Gama rounded the so uh, southern tip of Africa and established contact with India, thus laying the basis for Portuguese maritime uh, empire. Names like uh, Prince Henry there, you also have Diaz and da Gama. Both of those guys go down in history, as, or all those guys go down in history as being some of the most important figures in establishing global trade networks and exploration. All right, let's now move to the Spanish voyages. When Columbus, when Christopher Columbus approached the Spanish crown with the project of finding a new route to Asia, the Portuguese had already established their route to the Indian Ocean. The king and queen of Spain agreed to fund a modest voyage of discovery, and Columbus set out in 1492 with letters of introduction to Asian rulers and Arabic interpreters. This It says a modest voyage or mod, fund a modest voyage. They basically gave him very, very little. They said, eh, we'll throw a little money at you. Hopefully it works out. If not, we're not out too much money. After three voyages, Columbus was still certain he had found Asia. But other Europeans realized that he had discovered entirely new lands. These new discoveries led the Spanish and the Portuguese to sign what was called the Treaty of Tordesilla, in which divided the world between them along the line known uh, drawn down the center of the North Atlantic. Ferdinand Magellan's voyage across the Pacific confirmed Portugal's claim to uh, 
Portugal's claim to the Malacca Islands and established the Spanish claim to the Philippines. And so this really set the foundation, not only of global exploration, but also the, the rise in global commerce. Okay, it's very little right now, but especially when you get into the Cold War and post-Cold War, you see those foundation, foundations really flourish into something very, very profitable. Great map showing you some of the different routes that these guys took. The Tordesilla line, you see right there in the center. Asco de Gama's flagship and artist rendition. All right, so let's talk about encounters with Europe. We're going to look, kind of jump around to different areas of the uh, of the globe and how, what happened when they encountered some of these Europeans that were beginning to trade and expand. So let's start with Western Africa. During the 15th century, many Africans welcomed the Portuguese and profited from their trade in which they often held the upper hand. In return for their gold, Africans received from the Portuguese merchants a variety of Asian, African, and European goods, including firearms. Interaction between the Portuguese and the African rulers varied from place to place. The Oba, or king, of the powerful kingdom of Benin, or Benin sent an ambassador to Portugal to establish a royal monopoly on trade with the Portuguese. Benin exported a number of goods, including some slaves, and its rulers showed a mild interest in Christianity. After 1538, Benin purposely limited its contact with the Portuguese, declining to receive missionaries and closing the market and male slaves. The Kingdom of Congo had fewer goods to export and consequently relied more on the slave trade. When the Christian King Alfonso I lost his monopoly over the slave trade, his power was weakened and some of his subjects rose in revolts. And so now we're going to flip over and talk about Eastern Africa. In Eastern Africa, some of the Muslim states were suspicious of the Portuguese, while others welcomed the Portuguese as allies in their struggles against their neighbors. On the Swahili coast, Malindi befriended the Portuguese and was spared from the Portuguese attack and looted many other Swahili cities city-states in 1505. Christian Ethiopia sought and gained Portuguese support in its war against the Muslim forces at Adal. The Muslims were defeated, but Ethiopia was unable to make a long-term alliance with the Portuguese because the Ethiopians refused to transfer their religious loyalty from the Patriarch of Alexandria to the Roman Pope. And now we're going to move down to the Indian Ocean states. <clears throat> when Vasco da Gama arrived in Calicut in 1498, he made a very poor impression with his simple gifts. Nonetheless, the Portuguese were determined to control the Indian Ocean trade, and their supporters, or sorry, superior ships and firepower gave them the ability to do so. To assert control, the Portuguese bombarded the Swahili uh, city-states in 1505. They captured the Indian port of Goa in 1510. They took Hormuz, H-O-R-M-U-Z in 1515. Extending their reach eastward, the Portuguese captured Malacca in 1511 and set up a trading post in Macau in southern China in 1557. The Portuguese used their control of the, uh, over the major ports to require all spices to be carried in Portuguese ships and that all other ships purchase Portuguese passports and pay customs duties to the Portuguese. Reactions to the Portuguese aggression varied. The Mughal emperors took no action while the Ottomans resisted and were able to at least maintain superiority in the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf. Some smaller states cooperated with the Portuguese while others tried evasion and resistance. The Portuguese never gained complete control of the ocean, Indian Ocean trade, but they did dominate it enough to... Uh, dominated enough to bring themselves considerable profit and break the Italian city-state's monopoly on pepper because they had controlled that for a long time. All right, so now let's move over to the Americas. While, uh, while the Portuguese built a maritime trading empire in Africa and Asia, the Spanish built a territorial empire in the Americas. The reasons for the difference are to be found in the isolation of the Amer uh, Amerindian communities and their lack of resistance to old world diseases. The Arawak were an agriculture people who mined and worked gold, but did not trade it over long distances and had no iron. Spanish wars killed tens of thousands of Arawak and undermined their economy. By 1502, the remaining Arawak in Hispaniola were forced to serve as laborers for the Spanish. 
What the Spanish, uh, what the Spanish did in the Antilles was an extension of the Spanish actions against the Muslims in the previous centuries, defeating non-Christians and putting them and their land under Christian control. The actions of conquistadors in other parts of the Caribbean followed the same pattern. On the mainland, Hernan Cortes relied uh, relied on native allies, cavalry charges, steel swords, and cannon to defeat the forces of the Aztec Empire and capture Tenochtitlan. The conquest was also aided by the spread of smallpox among the Aztecs. Similarly, similar, similarly, sorry guys, Francisco Pizarro's conquest of the Incan Empire was made possible by the dissatisfaction of the Incan Empire's recently conquered peoples and by the Spanish cannon and steel swords. So new technology and diseases play a huge part in this right here. All right, so in conclusion, we're going to look at imperial comparisons and then economic comparisons. So imperial comparisons, in conclusion, one, strong centralized governments like China's were not inclined to attempt long-distance exploration. Two, weak rulers such as the Iberian monarchs left the details of exploration to individuals such as Columbus who proposed them. Three, Dominance of the Americas by Spain and Portugal were aided by native populations' vulnerability to European disease and other, or and by the superior weaponry of Europe. And then, and four, last one on, on this one, natives of Asia and Africa were immune to other to European diseases and from other contact were uh, from earlier contact and were more able to resist militarily. Now, some economic comparisons. You have two here. One. The first one, Europeans found sophisticated markets of trade networks in Africa and Asia. And then in two, in contrast, Europeans needed to introduce new technology and strong political control over American natives to exploit their natural resources. 